Right. And now I have the pleasure to announce yet another very good colleague and friend for his presentation. It's very nice actually to have this uh, chance today because we've been working, all of us, so closely together in recent years. Um, Professor Gerd Gründer is a psychiatrist and psychotherapist, and he's the head of the uh, Department in Molecular Neuroimaging at the Central Institute for Mental Health in Mannheim. He's also um, and in charge and the head of the first and largest uh, uh, psychedelic study done here in Germany, the episode trial. And um, together with uh, Gerd and Sergio, um, I had the pleasure to found uh, Ovid Clinics two years ago, and he's also this, one of the CEOs of Ovid Health Systems. Gerd, your talk today, Psychedelics and Psychiatry, an incremental step forward or a paradigm shift, yet another very important question, and I'm glad you're addressing it. Thank you, Andrea. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is an impressive audience compared to two years ago, especially with my boss in the audience. <laughs> I have given talks when he was in the audience, but I have not given this talk. <laughs> so um, it's an additional challenge. Um, I will, I, I, I believe many of you have the answer to that question or believe to have the answer to that question. Um, and I will put a lot of water into the wine, at least in the first half of my talk. And I will talk a little bit about my personal journey in this field and in psychiatry in general, and why I still believe that it's a paradigm shift that we are part of if we are doing things right. So, um, as you heard, I'm not only at the ZE, I'm, I, this is my major disclosure today. I'm co-founder of Ovid Health Systems, so we are developing psychedelic treatments. And this is my more general disclosure slide with a lot of industry on, on this chart. And this is also uh, some background to my, to my uh, history in psychiatry. I have done a lot of work with industry. I have done, done a lot of clinical trials with industry. I have studied a lot of psychotropic drugs in patients. So I start here, 1996. Most of the people in my group were just born at that time. Um, I'm showing this. This probably was the first clinical trial. This was not my first paper I was co-author on, but it was probably my first clinical trial. Um, this was a trial with 170 patients. It was an international multi-center trial. This was my first boss, Otto Benkert. He's now, he's now 83 years old and still very active. Um, I had the privilege to be co-author on this paper because I was the study physician who in, in the whole Clinical, multi-center clinical trial um, treated most, uh, the highest number of patients. Venlafaxine. So, uh, the, w the main result of that in that clinical trial was, um, you see here, we had an almost 100% response rate after six weeks. That's almost too good to be true. A response means a 50%, at least 50% change in Hamilton or Madras score. So one of these two scales, these are the major scales with which we measure success in depression research. And uh, the, the graph more or less shows that after six weeks, uh, almost everybody responded 
was not in remission, but at least responded. 170 patients uh, after six weeks, so that, that was a large, kind of large trial. And over the years, I have done many of these trials. I have treated many patients with venlafaxine. I have treated, I, I calculated this recently, how many patients I actually treated with psychotropic drugs, especially with antidepressants. Thousands. Over 30 years, I have treated thousands of patients with antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, tranquilizers. And um, venlafaxine, I still believe, is a very good antidepressant. It works. And I come back to that later. It works. There are many trials. So we, we have hundreds of trials with antidepressants like that. Hundreds. And we have many dozens, maybe also hundreds, but at least dozens of trials over a period of 12 months with hundreds of patients, more than 300 patients treated over 12 months, showing that antidepressants prevent relapse into depression better than placebo. Dozens of trials like that with hundreds of patients. If you add all these uh, numbers, you get thousands of patients showing that these drugs prevent relapse better than placebo. So the, these are just uh, two trials with venlafaxine. This is uh, paroxetine, published in 93, th 30 years ago. So uh, there, there are many, many trials with SSRIs in the public domain. Uh, you, you can see this is a very... Uh, I, Pick this uh, online, and, and the PDFs you find online of, of, of these old trials are kind of messy. This also shows after one year, paroxetine prevents relapse much, much better than placebo. Again, a trial, well, smaller trial, but still more than 100 patients. And we, in the psychedelic field, we are usually talking about much smaller trials. This is a newer drug. This is vortioxetine. L L U something is vortioxetine. Twenty years, ten, twenty years later. So this is a newer drug, vortioxetine. Again, a large trial with with more than four hundred patients. This is placebo. These are two doses of uh, vortioxetine and one dose of venlafaxine. So this was the trial against an active comparator and placebo. And it shows after six weeks, like many other trials show, uh, the active antidepressant is better than placebo and it's comparable to the active comparator venlafaxine. And the company LU stands for Lundbeck, a Danish company dedicated to the development of CNS drugs. Um, the company also did a relapse prevention trial, again with 400 patients. This is vortioxetine, this is placebo, uh, over th uh, 28, uh, 24 weeks, almost half a year. And again, this study shows that vortioxetine prevents relapse better than placebo. This compound is not available in Germany because at that time, 10 years ago, we began to, uh, or the authorities, the regulators began uh, to consider whether a new drug offers a benefit compared to what we have. That's in Germany called the AMNOC, Arzneimittelmarkt Neuordnungsgesetz. So, in general, internationally, this process is called HTA, Health Technology Assessment. So, the, the FDA, the EMA, they approve a drug, and the HTA authorities, in Germany, the GBA, Gemeinsamer Bundesausschuss, they fix a price. And they Based on this study, Lundbeck did 14 trials against placebo, 14 trials in, against placebo, hundreds of patients, more than 1,000 patients. They were all positive, 
but still the drug didn't make it to the German market because they were not able to show that the new drug was better than what we have. And that's the situation now in many European countries, not only in Germany. Germany has a especially strict uh, HTA process, but for example, in the NICE in, in Great Britain is, uh, is very similar. So, with new compounds or new treatments, we have to show that what we that it's better than what we have. Um, and this is the COMPASS trial, which was published almost a year ago now. Very important study, there's no doubt about it. The largest study to, uh, up to date. And uh, so it, it has uh, 233 patients by far the largest study. Our study, will, which will be finished soon, has 144 patients. And it shows the primary endpoint was measured after three weeks. This is here. And this is the high dose, 25 milligrams. This is one milligram. And it shows that the high dose is significantly better than the, than the one milligram dose, which is kind of active placebo. But what you also can see is that the, the difference between the high dose and the placebo decreases over time. And after 12 weeks, the, the, the uh, difference became quite small. So after 12 weeks, there are about 20% sustained responders. 20% sustained responders. So these curves look not as good as what we see with many antidepressants. Now you could argue um, this is treatment-resistant depression, correct. All the other studies I showed you are in MDD, major depressive disorder. This one is in treatment-resistant depression. So the patients are more chronic. They, are, um, they have had many treatments with many, in, in many cases, with many antidepressants before, like in our study. But still, we have treatments available for treatment-resistant depression, like SGA, second-generation antipsychotics, and they, uh, the, this meta-analysis shows SGA's work. This is S-ketamine. S-ketamine, in addition to an SSRI, works. Lithium works. So, if you want to show that a psychedelic has an additional benefit, you have to, you, you, you can have five placebo-controlled studies with hundreds of patients you get approval from the EMA and the FDA. But in Germany and probably in many other European countries, you don't get the, this, uh, the, the drug on the market and get it into public health insurance so that the payers will really pay for it. And that's a challenge. So we have to have different studies, better studies. This is a study, uh, I showed you the relapse prevention trials. This is a study, I, I think the, the best study we have over 12 months. This is open, 24 patients. This is from the Johns Hopkins uh, depression study. 24 patients, open treatment over one year. It's promising, of course, because these were still um, the, the, the patients got two doses, but if we want to get these drugs, these treatments, not only these drugs, these treatments to the patient, to as many patients as possible, we have to do better studies. Um, why do I still believe that psychedelics represent a paradigm shift. I showed you on purpose that my first clinical trial with Van Lefaxin. Um, I will tell you a bit of my personal story, how I came to psychedelics. In 2008, a very good friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, 
became depressed. The depression came from nowhere. One morning, my friend was severely depressed, so he asked me for help. And I did what I thought I could do best. I administered an antidepressant. I started with agomelatin. Agomelatin at that time was just a few years on the market. Uh, I picked agomelatin because it has no side effects, but it doesn't work either. <laughs> so after three weeks, nothing had changed. And then I picked venlafaxine. And again, I believe all these drugs that I showed you in the beginning, especially venlafaxine, I've treat, treated most of my uh, depressed patients I treated with venlafaxine because I believe it's a very good antidepressant. So I administered venlafaxine and after two weeks the depression was gone. It was really, there was complete remission, super responder. Um, time went on. And um, my friend um, and I, we at a certain point tried to stop the medication. So we tapered off the medication. Uh, there was some change in the, medi in, in the dose. We tapered the medication from 150 to 75, that was okay, and then to 30 point, uh, 37.5. And then uh, he got into trouble because he realized uh, withdrawal symptoms. So it was not really possible to stop the medication. In 2014, my friend went to a scientific conference and I re remember that very clearly what uh, happened there. Uh, that was a conference that started in, he drove there by car on a Wednesday. Um, it, the, the conference was in Amsterdam on a Wednesday. So he drove there and he realized in the evening I forgot my medication. The conference went on to, till Saturday. So on, on Thursday, he realized, okay, I, I, uh, I have no medication, n no chance, I have to go through it. On Friday, he already noticed that this is a severe situation. He was really in a severe, in a serious withdrawal syndrome. On Saturday, the last day of the conference, he, he was almost absent at the conference. Uh, he drove home in the afternoon of this, ap uh, after, uh, of, of this conference, in the, on Saturday afternoon, he drove home and he felt like a junkie. He doesn't know, he didn't know how he got home. When he got home, the first thing he did, he took the medication, it was um, like being on Turkey, and one hour later, everything was gone. The whole withdrawal was gone, so this is not relapse, this is a severe withdrawal syndrome. This was in, in the New York Times in 2018, on the first page, on the front page of the New York Times. Many people taking antidepressants discover they cannot quit. I recommend this highly to every, everybody, especially to psychiatrists. Um, the interesting thing is that many psychiatrists responded to that article. These were almost 40 Columbia psychiatrists, Columbia University, New York. And they wrote, although withdrawal has not been well studied, that's correct, the clinical consensus is that it is real, absolutely. Rare, that's wrong, it's absolutely wrong, it's very common, and it is always treatable. And this is complete nonsense, it's not always treatable. I know how to treat uh, alcohol withdrawal, I know how to treat 
de alcohol delirium. Every second year resident in psychiatry knows how to treat alcohol withdrawal. We have very good treatments. I know how to treat heroin withdrawal. It's possible. It's, it's, not, it's not simple, but it's possible. But I don't know, I have no idea how to treat antidepressant withdrawal. So, one year later, so he, stopped, he started the medication again, and we already realized that we are in trouble how to get rid of this medication. Uh, in one year later, he realized that there's another problem, and that's the loss of emotions. Um, in 2015, the first grandchild of my friend was born. And he just didn't care. He had lost connection to his children. He had lost connection to his then-born grandchild. He had lost connection to his own feelings. And that's also a very common problem with long-term treatment with serotonergic antidepressants. Um, this was pub oops. This was published in The Guardian early, earlier this year, in, in January. Antidepressants can cause emotional blunting, study shows. This is, uh, if you treat patients with antidepressants, this is uh, very common. It's often neglected by psychiatrists, but it's very common. So this was not a surprising finding, but it was a study by a very prominent researchers from Great Britain, Cambridge uh, psychiatrists and psychologists. Um, this uh, was a study with very prominent authors, Trevor Robbins, Barbara Kitsahakian, Gitte Knudsen. It was published in Neuropsychopharmacology. And in that, in that uh, newspaper article, Barbara Sahakian, the senior author on that paper, said, the works senior author, Pro Professor Barbara Sahakian of the University of Cambridge said, in a way, this may be in part how they work. They take away some of the emotional pain that people who experience depression feel, but unfortunately, it seems that they also take away some of the enjoyment. So they blunt, th that's uh, how, how they work. They blunt emotions. They blunt the pain, but they also blunt the enjoyment. And, or enjoyment. Um, so, we realized we have to do something. So, we, um, my, we tapered off again the medication. And at a certain point, he had to go through with that. That was in 2016. He went through a month-long many months long withdrawal syndrome, um, which was really terrible from, from the outside. Um, and then he, then he drove to the Netherlands and bought some truffles. And then he took a high dose of truffles, accompanied by his girlfriend. And um, the, the experience was not something like uh, unity with the universe or oceanic boundlessness. The experience was an in, in, uh, the, the feeling that joy and pain can be experienced at the same time. There was an intense feeling of pain and, and, and joy at the same time. And the insight of that experience was pain and suffering are part of the human condition.
we have to accept pain. You can, we can suppress pain with an antidepressant, but it, com it comes at a huge price. So, by just accepting pain, he um, realized that you can live with pain, it will never go away, but that's life. So what, what did I learn from that story? Um, that was, not, now we are in 2018, that was the year when I came to Mannheim. And I remember that day when I moved to Professor Andreas Lind Meyer Lindenberg and told him that I want to do a study with psilocybin in depression. And he said, well, that's fine. Great, I support you. And that was great. Uh, I have to thank you that you, since then, constantly supported me in this work, or us. Um, so we started that study, and it, uh, it, it really changed uh, many of my views. I learned a lot over the course of the last two or two and a half years that we now treated and accompanied patients and clients. I learned a lot and I rethought many of my pre prejudices. prejudices. Um, for example, what is a mental disorder? And what is health? What is health? Where's the difference or the border between health and a mental disorder? This paper here came out just a few days ago, last week, in the Lancet Psychiatry, so a very prestigious journal. Um, and it shows something that Professor Meyer Lindenberg already mentioned, that 40% of all people will, at, at a certain point in their life, will suffer from a mental disorder. This study shows that, it's, that, that the number is even higher. These two lines uh, show hazard ratios, or hazard rates. This doesn't work smoothly. Uh, so it shows um, that uh, the highest uh, risk for developing a mental disorder is here at age 15, around age 15, or between 15 and 20. So, um, in adolescence. But well, uh, the interesting things uh, are these curves here, that's cumulative incidences. And this is incidence per 1,000 participants. And you can see here 500, at age 75, 500 of 1,000, so one half will have developed a mental disorder. Well, the, the thinking in our, um, in, in psychiatry, as far as I see it, is once you are in the field of having a mental disorder, you are in that, you're, you have a mental disorder. You often read that mental disorders are chronic, chronic diseases, d depression is a chron chronic uh, disorder. If you, get, uh, if you get into the system, where you, you can suffer from depression at age 20. If you are being treated in the system and it, your, your, your diagnosis is documented somewhere, you will never get a private health insurance anymore. Because in health, private health insurance, once you have had anything, any psychiatric disorders, maybe not spider phobia, you are in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the mental disease class. So at, at birth, we are all healthy. There's no mental disease. By age 20, um, you, you, we have this, I give up, <laughs> you have this um, 
increasing section of people with mental disease. And it's getting bigger and bigger, and it's a one-way street. You, can, you, you get from the healthy people to the people with mental disease, but you cannot go back. Yeah, that's a problem. And that's where I see the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. Henrik talked about salutogenesis. We improve health. So that's where I see the field, the, the, the potential. Long-term treatment with antidepressant doesn't make you healthy again. Get rid of the construct depression because you are still treating your ongoing disease. You are preventing that it comes back. With these kinds of treatments, we at least try, and I think we, there's a good chance to put a lot of people back to this section here, healthy people. But what we have to do is we have to do better studies, larger studies. We have to compare psychedelics against what we have. That's for example, in depression, we have to compare it with antidepressants. We have to do long-term studies, not just six or three-week studies with a primary endpoint at three weeks. We have to define primary endpoints at six months, for example. We have to show that they increase quality of life, that they increase functionality, that they don't, that, they, that, that there are less relapses into depression. I'm sure that we can show this, but it's, it's a, really a challenge. It's a long-term goal. It will cost a lot of money, and it's not done in two years. Um, salutogenesis, how, what is that? It's, it's, uh, you have seen the quotes in, in Max Wolf's talk. Um, the quotes of the patients. I, can sh I, I show you a drawing of one of our patients. She, she drew this um, in the evening of her dosing session. A very intelligent uh, woman, uh, very, very differentiated. She, she drew her way through her life and she considered herself as being on a journey. It's a journey probably from, from disease, pain, pain back to, back to the sun, back to life. There's no clear border between health and disease. We are all walking on thin ice. We can break through, we can get sick, but we can also go back. And um, I would like to stop, uh, to, to, to end with a, also with a quote of a patient. And first I, I would like to announce this symposium from the episode team, both from uh, Charité and ZE, which will take place on Saturday, I believe, Saturday. Uh, it's about spiritual and existential themes as experienced by episode psilocybin trial patients. I took just one quote. I think with psilocybin you can briefly, how should I say it now? It's like, it's like opening a window for me, like opening a door and then seeing, oh, there's another world. And if you stay with it, there's, there is meaning or I discovered the meaning. And I knew, okay, I have a goal and what I'm experiencing experiencing in the here and now, it's not the whole truth, it's not just that, it's much more, and I saw it, I felt it, and feeling it was the best thing, and so on. So, um, I have to thank all, all, all these patients. It's not only, we also, in, in our trial team, we, um, we are not the patients are not just grateful for us um, to be 
treated by us, we are also grateful for the patients. Um, grateful to the patients because um, it's a privilege to join so-called patients on their way to maybe not a lower Hamilton score, but to a different experience of their lives. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I thank all these patients. I thank the thousands of patients I've treated with uh, psychotropic drugs. I learned a lot. I made, made many mistakes. Um, I learned a lot and I'm still learning. And so this is my, this is part of the team. And as you can see here, it's hard to get everybody uh, together. The team has increased in number. Uh, I think today we have 12 or 13 people here from the team. Uh, I think we are the largest group um, here at the conference from one side. Um, it's really a pleasure to work with you. Um, I've never, never experienced uh, such a spirit and enthusiasm for the work we are doing together. A few days ago, somebody from, uh, hel hel uh, from Human Resources came to me for, for talking about future personal planning, human resources, and she, 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 she said, the, the number of sick days in your department is surprisingly low. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm really grateful for what I'm doing right now with, my, with the people here with me. And I, we, we have to take the opportunity to make a better photo with everybody here. Please don't go home without making a new photo. And um, yeah, I'm very grateful. Uh, this is uh, the most, this is not only the most rewarding work I've ever done, but also I believe the most meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Gerd. 